Well, um, what an incredible honor and privilege to be um, with all of you here today. Uh, this is an incredible three days of learning, and I feel just totally, my heart is full to have an opportunity to be with you in this space and, and part of your learning journey, um, because in all reality, the work we do in the classroom is a journey. And uh, it's, it's, it's a constant evolving and rethinking. So I'm super excited to be here with you today. And I know um, at the end of our talk, we will have a Q&A and I'm excited to hear any kind of questions that you may have. So I'm here um, to talk to you about this idea of, of comprehension and what it looks like in the secondary schools. So before we get started, um, I thought it would be great to understand a little bit about myself so I come to you from Wisconsin, and um, I was an active teacher for 33 and a half years. I taught uh, multiple grade levels, third grade, fifth grade, and I was a balanced literacy teacher, like most of us in the country were. Um, and then when I shifted into seventh grade English language arts, and I had an opportunity to take some coursework along uh, structured literacy to support some of my struggling readers in the upper grades, um, I just discovered this idea of the science of reading and structured literacy. So in reality, as an upper school, upper grade level teacher, I've I always kind of have been very much structured in my instruction, and I um, taught really explicitly for the most part in my upper grades. And then I became um, not only a seventh grade English language arts teacher, but I was a reading specialist and secondary interventionist. So I've worked with all kinds of learners and students, um, six through 12, in all areas of reading. So um, I'm excited to be here. It's a beautiful day in Wisconsin. I hope it's a beautiful day wherever you are at. So let's go ahead and we'll get started. So we cannot have a conversation about any kind of instruction unless we're really grounded in the theoretical frameworks that really guide what we do. No matter what, if it's instruction or assessment, we have to be grounded in the simple view of reading. So um, the simple view came to us in 1986, and I always kind of chuckle when I hear that date because I got my undergrad um, in 1989 in elementary education, and I graduated without any clue to the simple view of reading existing. So um, if this content is coming to you new today, give yourself grace because we can't control the environments um, in our college education that we were provided in our professional development, um, but but we cannot move forward in any kind of conversations regarding instruction unless we understand that what is reading comprehension, because that's ideally in the secondary school what we're looking at, right? So as a reading specialist, I often would have teachers come up to me and say, my kids can't comprehend. My, my, my kids can't comprehend. What do I do? What do, what do I do? They, 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 they can't they can't get to their test or whatever it was. And then we'd have to sit down and we'd have to have some conversations about what is comprehension. So we know in order for kids to get to that idea of comprehension, they have to be able to decode the words. You can't get to comprehension unless you can read the words on the page, right? Which means phonemic awareness and phonics. And generally speaking, the kids we get in the secondary school, if they're struggling with that comprehension, they probably do have um, a challenge with um, decoding. But for most of us, and how we're going to live today in this presentation is in the idea of the space of language comprehension, focusing in on that space, on how we can improve our instruction in this space in order to get kids where we want to go. Um, Again, as I move through this talk today, um, I'm going to be certainly grounded in Scarborough's rope. Um, so Hala Scarborough developed this infographic in 2001, a year after the National Reading Panel Report. And this metaphor for reading shows the different skills that must develop over time in order for reading to occur. Each strand interacts with one another, but each one represents a target for explicit instruction. 
In examining the upper strands of the rope, which we will be doing today, it's important to understand that the outcome of skilled reading, so you can see word recognition is the lower strand, which is decoding the simple view of reading. Here is our language comprehension or upper strand. In order for students to get to that, what we call mental model, that visual representation of a text, right? We really do have to make sure that we are working through all the strands strands and teaching them explicitly. Now, if you're thinking about your textbook, your anthology, your curricular resources in front of you, more than likely, few of them address all of these strands in an explicit way. And that's why we have to rethink a little bit about how we are approaching our instruction to really teach with the reading brain in mind. Because as Hollis teaches us in her infographic, all of these strands are working together in order to get to that skilled reading, that mental model. Now, some of you might be very aware of those two models. You might be less aware of this one, which I really love when we talk about comprehension, um, because this model called the DEER model, the direct and indirect effects model of reading developed by um, uh, Young Suk Kim in 2020. And this is a research tested model. OK, she just didn't make this up over her head, but you can kind of see how she breaks again down the simple view, the rope in kind of the same way. Right. So we have the pillars of word reading and the pillar of listening language comprehension. We have the pill. We have our text reading fluency that has to happen that we have in Scarborough's rope and the simple view. And here's our mental model. But look what she does with this theoretical framework. Right. The foundation is what? our early literacy skills, that word recognition that has to happen. But she also brings our attention to the higher order of cognition and regulation. And we know we have some students, right, that are going to have some differences in their ability to access text really through um, inferential thinking, perspective taken, reasoning. Then what we have on the bottom right, the bottom foundation, the general cognitive skills executive functions, working memory, inhibitory control, and attentional control. So the reading brain, right, has to be able to attend to print and attend to that content while inhibiting other things that are coming into the brain. We know we have students that have significant challenges, particularly those in the upper grades, right, um, who are struggling with those cognitive and executive functioning skills. We have to keep in mind, and what I talk to you today will help support all students in accessing that text. Um, those models help us really understand the processes of reading. And again, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know, right? Um, I'm gonna share with you another framework, another model that really helps us think about our planning of our instruction. So this model comes from the RAN study group. And in all reality, if we think about our work in the secondary schools, we have many students, right, that are asked to do some high level thinking, but yet are still struggling. We have unacceptable gaps, really, in what our kids are able to do and what they're supposed to be able to do. And the reality is our textbooks, our resources really do not support that instruction to reach all of our learners. So there's little time really that we have had and I have some really good friends that are my sister was a high school English teacher for 33 years I have a really good friend who is a high school English teacher and she'd always say to me Jeannie I I only had one credit in teaching reading like I don't know how to how to teach a child to read and I, I don't really know how to break things down um, to help support all readers gaining access and this is how I'm hoping to guide you today. So when we look at the RAND study group heuristic model we're thinking we have the social and cultural context in which kids um, come into our classrooms and we really want to break it down into these three parts right. So first of all we have our text right? And there's text complexity. And in that text complexity, right, we have content, we have vocabulary, 
we have text structures, and we have genre, right? And we think about vocabulary and text structure. I kind of talked about that in the simple view of reading, right? Um, and, and I talked about that in the rope model. So all these come together. So I want you to think about complexity for once because a lot of us in the upper grades, right? We're kind of like dialed in on our novels. So this was a novel that I used in fifth grade, matter of fact, loved Gary Paulson, Hatchet, Brian's Winter, incredible book. So when we think about text complexity, and any of you have read that book, right? We have one main character. We have one problem. He has to survive the winter. We have one solution. Does he survive? So if we think about the narrative text structure, it's pretty simple read right? But guess what a lot of us like to do? We like to look at our Lexile numbers. Did you know the Lexile is 1,140 for that text? Based on that number, that would be benchmark for 11th grade. We would never give this book to 11th grader. Then we have a book called The Book Thief, right? Complex structure has more than one plot, more than one character set in World War II, um, probably has significant uh, new vocabulary word, words that kids have to navigate. Lexile, 730. And so a lot of us as and educators, right, we're kind of in this idea that we got to just know what Lexile the kids are at and we got to know what Lexile we need to give our students. But they're kind of false. It's a false, they're false, it's false information because it's based on the complexity of the sentence length and structure. And if you know Gary Paulson, he writes really long sentences. So when you think about your planning of your instruction, we want to make sure that we provide students with grade level complex text. And we can't always rely on a Lexile to do that. When we plan on our activities that we're asking kids to do, I want you to think about all that has to happen within that activity, right? We have all the linguistic processes of all the different strands of the reading rope that are working together, the semantic processes of that vocabulary, the cognitive abilities, working memory, executive functioning that we talked about, and this idea of comprehension monitoring. How are we supporting that? We have to think about that as we organize our activity. Then we have the reader, right? And this reader comes to us with motivation, some of them, and I know I taught seventh grade English language arts. I think it's the hardest grade to teach, right? Talk about motivation to read. Um, very challenging to get them excited about reading. Um, and then they come to us with a vast difference of knowledge and experience. So when we think about all of these parts and pieces, we know that reading is difficult. And the RAND study group, right, teaches us that what is reading comprehension? It really is, and I want you to think about this for a minute, the simultaneously extracting and constructing meaning with the interaction and involvement with the written language, bringing what we know about the text and the author's message, and we're doing that iteratively all throughout the passage. So when we say our kids are not comprehending, we're realizing, oh my gosh, now I know why it's so hard at the end and why so many of our students are struggling because it is a complex process. Um, so I love this definition um, that, and I think about, I love this image. If you think about what reading comprehension is, it really is an orchestrated product, right? All that happening in the reading brain at one time. So it's not a single entity that can be explained in a unified cognitive model. Instead, it is the orchestrated product of a set of linguistic and cognitive processes operating on text, interacting with background knowledge, features of the text, and the purpose and goals of the reading situation. Oh my, no wonder so many of our students struggle in our classrooms. It is a complex process. And our kids need a lot more explicit instruction than our textbooks and our training has given us to provide. It just has. So before we get started, I kind of want you just to think about what your typical English language arts instruction looks and feels like. And I said, I was in the middle school for 15 years. My, um, I worked with teachers six through 12. 
And generally speaking, it was the experience was wrapped around a lot of novel studies and high level content in the upper grades, like your American Lit, your Shakespeare, right? Um, and most of the time, it's kind of sit and get, right? Uh, students have the book, teachers are reading, they're asking kids popcorn reading along um, and trying to figure out how to read it. So what I'm gonna ask you today is I'm gonna ask you to rethink your approaches, which can be hard. So I want you to th rethink and probably consider letting go of some of those practices that you've been using for a very long time lean into a possible new way of approaching so all students have access to the content and the learning, and then learn a few new ways and tricks that you can possibly add to what you already do. So as we move forward, we cannot not move forward without being grounded in, yes, the simple view of reading, but yes, we are kind of tethered to our core standards. I remember when the Common Core came out and uh, we had a big rollout in our district and we had to unpack the standards and we had to bring in the standards into our classrooms. I was seventh grade English language art at that time. And I think as I've worked in this space and worked in many schools across the country and have been in countless different trainings, we have a, we have a, we have to continue to evolve our thinking around the core standards. All right, so we have to remember that it's not a curriculum, right? It does not prescribe or require how teachers teach. They are not specific enough to serve as learning targets for a district or a school. And this is where I see wobbles, where our standards become our target. And that is what we're teaching but our standards are how we get to the target. It's how our scaffolding of what they need to be able to do to get there, okay? Um, they are not a test. They are not something we're gonna practice and practice and practice in isolation so they can perform on a state test. Again, they're a roadmap to get where we our outcome measure. What do we know for sure? They are ground, they're rigorous and grounded in research on college and career readiness. We know they have the potential to increase efficiency in defining and using learning targets for curriculum and assessment purposes. So let's talk about learning targets, which is really critical to our instructions. If they're not common core state standards, then what are our learning targets? What are high quality learning targets that we have to have visible in our room every day and our kids need to know why they're there, right? Well, our learning targets need to have cognitive rigor, right? And what we were, ta what we were talking about earlier, it's like, it's not, I'm going to ask them to do more. It's how deeply I want them to think about the text and where I want them to go. Our targets should be measurable. They should be clear, vertically aligned, follow a scope and sequence, and they should be coherent. And critically important, our kids should know what the learning targets are. I've been in a lot of classrooms. I walk in and I don't think the kids even know why they're reading, but they're just reading because the teacher said that they're reading today, right? And so we wanna be really clear to our students why they're reading, right? And then how we're gonna measure that. So we need to know that a learning targets define what all students should know and be able to do as a result of universal instruction. Okay, sit on that for a minute. Hopefully you're rethinking some things that you're doing. So how should learning targets be used? Curriculum materials, no matter how well designed they are, should not drive the decisions about what students should learn. And I think we love that as educators, right? That's what I loved about being in the classroom, was be able to think about what is it that I really want my students to grapple with from reading this text, right? Our curriculum materials should be tools that are used to engage students in learning that is focused on what the school has defined what is important for them to learn, 
And maybe it's for you, it's your school, it's your grade level team, it's your ELA department, right? So what I loved about being in the classroom is really wrestling with that content. So how should learning targets be used? Well, they should drive our instruction. They should tell us exactly what I want my students to learn from reading this text, but it's not a common core standard, okay? They should engage my students in the text, which is really a challenge in the upper grades, right? And they should drive our assessment. Now, when we think about learning targets, if it's not a common core state standards, how do we come up with them? What I loved as an educator using Hess's cognitive rigor matrix to help guide my thinking about what do we really want kids to know by the end of reading their text. And we know cognitive rigor grows at the higher levels of the DOK, right? Where we want to make sure whatever our learning target is, we really want it to be embedded in the DOK three or four because that is the cognitive rigor, right? We want our kids to be engaged in, in our classrooms. And this was really helpful for me to guide my thinking as I was coming up with the learning target of what my, acti what I, my activity, right? With the purpose of my activity in my classroom. Now, I would want you to rethink a little bit because if we're going to get kids to evaluate, to create and synthesize, it's really hard to do when we spend a whole month on one novel. Really rethinking that and considering Maybe it's not so much I'm going to be surrounding my teaching around a novel study, but the research really is clear. We build more knowledge around text sets. And I want to really encourage you to think about how you can use sets of texts to develop that learning target that is going to provide that cognitive rigor for all students. And now some of you might be thinking in the back of your mind, but I have kids who can't read, but they can think. And this is why we're talking about listening comprehension. And one thing that I had to do when I went through my national board, and some of you maybe have gone through that process, is making sure all kids had access to grade level text. And so we want to make sure that we are providing grade level text across the board to all students, um, even though they might have challenges in word recognition. And I'll kind of show you how you can support and scaffold that as we go. Um, but when we're thinking about text sets, right, we're thinking about a common theme or a subject area that's going to build knowledge and vocabulary. Um, I think sometimes we have to, and I think there's a really good teaching out there. I've seen it. I know some of you are probably on this call today that you also use a variety of texts to support your students. So I'm not necessarily just talking about the printed page. I'm talking about texts when it comes to videos, um, podcasts, images, um, as well as the written page. So when I think about, okay, so I'm going to have a unit around civil rights in the middle school. And I'm going to grab a bunch of different texts that's going to support my essential question and my learning target. And I don't know if some of you use Common Lit, but that is my most favorite um, tool to use in the upper grades because it has a plethora of options. And it's free. Right, it's free, you can use it. Um, so if I'm gonna do a, a common theme around the civil rights movement, I'm gonna grab an informational text from, you can see what the Lexile is, right? I'm going to grab um, a speech and I'm going to grab an image. Now, this is a text set and this is what I'm gonna spend multiple days on as we really dive into, right? What is my learning target? What is it that I want them to know? And again, for our kids who struggle with word recognition, they have a lot to say when you show them an image. And I know I experienced that, right? Those are the ones that give you the goosebump moments. I just couldn't believe some of the things that they had brought into our conversation. So I want you to rethink a little bit about 
Could you use more sets that you can really dive deep to get to that cognitive rigor and get to that learning target? So I'm gonna go back to um, this, right? Uh, Rand study groups heuristic model about text, activity, reader. So what is it that you want students to know and be able to do? And then how do you want them to show that? So let me ask you a question. What's your favorite movie? Maybe you're dropping it in the chat. I can't see them. As you can see, one of my favorites, Hunger Games. I love that main character, Katniss. How many times have you watched your favorite movie? I know I've seen Hunger Games, read the book, watched the movie multiple times. So after repeated viewing, how has your understanding of the narrative changed? After you read it again and again and again or saw the movie a second, third time, did you see things that you did not see the first time? Did you have an awareness or an aha moment? Like, oh, now I get what that little symbol means. I didn't see it the first time because I was too busy trying to just get through the movie and get it, get the surface of it, right? So then I have a question. So if your mental model, your visual representation of the movie, the film, the book changed after multiple viewings, why do we have students just read a text once and move on? Like I'm just as enthusiastic about seeing Hunger Games a 10th time as I was when I read it the first time. So we have to rethink that, right? Because in all reality, what the research has shown, and it kind of supports where I'm going with that film, is why repeated reading is necessary of a text. Because the first time a child, a student, you read a text or view a film, you're really just at the surface level. It's called the surface code. And you're just kind of recognizing the words on the page. You're activizing from knowledge. You're just really at the surface level. And then what has to happen is our brains, our reading brains and all that's going on has to get to the next level, which is that text code, where we start to get to that literal meaning of the text and we're connecting between the sentences and the paragraphs and we're connecting between um, one page and the other. And remember what reading comprehension is. It's a simultaneous extraction and construction of meaning with the interaction of the written page over a period of time. It's iterative. Right. So as a reader is working through the text, right, they're constantly updating, right, what their mental model is based on the new information the author gave. Right. Well, that happens for some kids. It can happen in the first read. For the majority of kids, it doesn't. And then we need to get to that situational model, which is now where the reader has that mental representation of the text based on the intertwining of the background knowledge and the meaning of the text. Now, it's very, now you do have probably a, a percentage of kids who can read a text for the first time and they can get down to that situational model and they can get to that learning target and they can do what you want them to do, but majority of your kids cannot, right? And so um, this is a framework that I used in my classroom. I use this with students. It's not something that I just made up because I saw something. I actually use this. So it's in the platform. I shared it with you so you can grab it. Um, and it's accessible to you. So I kind of cre created a, a lesson template, lesson planning template that takes us through the reading rope, teaches us explicitly how to teach all those parts so all kids can get to that mental model in the end. So step one is A, just planning your purpose, right? What is your text set in your theme? What is the title of your book? What is your purpose for reading? And as I said, many kids don't know why they're reading something. That has to be on our boards. That has to be clear. This is why we're reading this. This is the question I want you to answer. So you can see what I have here. How are nonviolent protests effective for making change? So that is a pretty broad question. So no matter which text we're reading, we're coming back to that, 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 non that question and we're adding. And guess what all of us want us to do? And one of our common core standard is to what? Cite text evidence. And so what we're doing is as we're grappling with that universe, that essential question is we're citing evidence as we go, no matter which text we're reading, because guess what I want them to be able to do after spending 
maybe a month on this topic because we're going to go deep as I want them to be able to write an argument for the most effective nonviolent protest, okay, to initiate change. So as they're grappling with, that's cognitive rigor now, right, is writing an argument, which is a huge piece of our common core standards in the upper grades. You can write an argument about everything. And um, that's what they're grappling with the whole entire time. So this learning target is not going to change too much. It's going to be the same no matter what text they're reading. Understand the most effective nonviolent process. So after they read a text, okay, what was the most effective in this text? What was the most effective in the next text? Now bring it together form an opinion, go back and find your evidence, and now you can write your paper. So they're not, they're collecting as they're going, which is super powerful. I did this with my students. Um, but we have to design deliberate instruction. Kids are not gonna get to that point, that success criteria by reading for something one time, right? That's a huge cognitive load. So what I have to do is I have to plan my deliberate instruction and I have to plan what I'm going to teach before I even hand them the page, right? So I have to think about these really, and again, what am I going through? The language strands of the reading rope, background knowledge, vocabulary, language structure, verbal reasoning, and literary knowledge. So on my lesson planning template, right, I have to think before they read about my background knowledge. How can I activate and support them to access their knowledge? Because um, the re researchers, so Amy Elman is a great researcher in this space, and I was just listening to her speak to um, comprehension and inferencing, and she, even though some of our kids have um, background knowledge, they don't always access it when they're supposed to. So we have to actually support them explicitly accessing what I believe they already know. Because some kids think about, think about executive functioning, think about working memory, right? Think about inhibitory control. They don't have it. They can't, they can't bring it in. We have to support them. And so all kids. Then I have to think about which vocabulary words I'm going to teach explicitly before they read. And we're going to talk about this some more. And as we go along, I'll come back to it. But you can see I have a routine. So I have to give a student-friendly definition, examples, non-examples, questions to interact. I think pair, share. I want them to talk about the word. And I want them to see it, say it, and write it. Then I want to look ahead and I want to see which sentence actually is going to be really a tough sentence. I'm going to come back to that and I'm going to teach it before they read because I'm lowering the cognitive load as they're reading so they can access the text. Verbal reasoning. Now, for a lot of our kids um, that are going to have challenges in the classroom, they're going to struggle with inferencing, right? Because inferencing is the heart of comprehension. It's what they're asked to do. But what do they need to infer? They need vocabulary and they need background knowledge. And so if they don't have the words and they don't have the knowledge, it's hard for them to infer. So I have to think about which, which part do I really think I have to kind of talk about before they're reading. I can show them explicitly how you're going to connect this vocabulary word, what it means to what the passage is saying, and I'm going to think in my head. You're going to model that. You want to model, model, model your own thinking. We don't do enough of that in the upper grades. And then, again, figurative language. Some of our kids, right, similes, metaphors, personification, symbolism, we, we might want to teach some of those beforehand. Depending upon our demographics and which kids need, we're going to have to figure out which ones do they need to know in order to access text. And then literary knowledge. This is, this is the rope now, graphic organizers. I have to think about which graphic organizer I'm going to use to help students. And we'll talk about the research when it comes to that. So if I'm reading narrative text, I'm going to have to have a plot diagram in the, in the classroom. I go to many classrooms. I don't see plot diagrams everywhere. We assume kids understand that. They don't all know those. So we have to have that in front of them. Um, if we're reading informational text, right, we need to have a, a, some kind of graphic organizer that shows, okay, this is description, this is sequence. Now, a lot of our informative texts actually have what? Cause and effect and problem solution in one text. So I have to pick one that I'm going to have the kids focus on whatever my learning target is, okay? Um, so how can I create some background knowledge for students before they read? A lot of these, you guys, these probably aren't new. So hopefully I'm just making you more aware, like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Remember, a lot of this stuff is not real novel, right? It's been around a long time. It's just that so much is thrown at us at one time, we kind of forget. But
But what I love doing every time we were going to read a pre quiz, I love doing anticipation guides. I love just doing a picture introduction like that picture of Rosa Parks. I'd have that up on the board. Not, it's not a board anymore. Probably your smart screen now, right? Um, I had a smart board. I don't think anybody uses those anymore. Um, but anyways, I'd have that up and we would talk and we would spend a lot of time having conversations about what was going on. That's text. Um, we want to do that before we read, okay? Um, because we know, so this is where the research comes in, okay? Um, it's on the bottom here. Acquisition of new knowledge is faster when something is already known about the text. We have to make sure that they know something before we read that, okay? All right. So we're going to talk about vocabulary next. And a little anecdote, right, is understanding that students' vocabulary consists of spoken words and printed words. And sometimes students are able to use and understand spoken words that they do not recognize in print. For example, nearly all students know a tongue is, and they use the word tongue in conversation. However, because of its unusual spelling, many students struggle when it comes to across the word in print. So this is likely to happen with other words, including those that are longer and multi-syllabic. And so when we think about the simple view of reading, right, we know word recognition times listening comprehension gets to reading comprehension, but what do they need to know? Lots of vocabulary. And I'll show you the research on the next slide on that. Um, it's critical to understand, and this is, I remember, right, the year 2000, right, that was right prior to the Reading First Days, this thing called the National Reading Panel Report came out, and um, I, I had heard of it, but I really didn't understand exactly what it was teaching me because it wasn't in my world, and maybe some of you, it's not in yours, and this is new learning, but this is what the research is, the meta-analyses of all the research that was done prior to 2000, and this is what they found to be true. Vocabulary instruction should encompass both direct in indirect approaches. So the direct instruction is what I'm teaching before they read. Indirect is as I go along and we'll talk about that. This is where we probably drop off a little bit in our instruction. I think we have to be honest with ourselves. Um, repetition and exposure to vocabulary words through multiple contexts are essential, right? Kids need to see that word multiple times before they know that word in their, they have it part of their le own lexicon. Okay, sometimes we just share it once and we just move on. Immersing students in rich context fosters deeper vocabulary understanding and active engagement in learning tasks is key to effective vocabulary instruction. So I go back to this rich context, right? So one thing that we do, because we thought that that was probably a good thing through differentiation is give kids text at a lower level meaning a lower lexile level. I know um, ELA News did this, right? Where you can grab, you have, you can grab a different lexile. We think we're differentiating. And actually um, what we're doing is we're robbing children of vocabulary, right? We, we shouldn't be doing that. We want to make sure that we keep the vocabulary at grade level. Um, we don't want to be giving them a graphic novel and if they can have access to the novel, right? So because we, we want to keep fostering that deep vocabulary. So when we're selecting words that we're going to teach, this comes from Beck's work and her um, book, um, Bringing Words to Life. Um, we're focusing on those tier two words, high quality words, I would say that are content rich. Like these are the critical words that the kids need to know and understand in order to do that, that um, grade level, that learning target that I've identified. Okay. Um, now, some of our kids, our ELL uh, multilingual learners, are, are going to need support with our tier one words. And ideally, we're bridging our intervention with our core instruction. And during our intervention time, the kids are getting this pre taught any words that they might not know that are considered our one syllable Anglo-Saxon words that are in that text. I said, ideally, right? I know this is not all happening. I say, ideally, okay? So we need to think about what three to five words will I teach explicitly before reading the text? Those are, what words are the most critical to understanding the overarching idea of the text? We're talking, those are text critical words. 
then I you also have to ask yourself that question like what high utility language critical are their words. So if I were to be reading a text, doing a series, right, that related to um, civil rights movement, and they're going to write an argumentative piece about the most effective nonviolent protests, they're going to need to know the word segregate. They're going to have to know that word very, very well. And so that's the one I'm going to pick. I think it's important that we understand the research behind vocabulary is that understanding the meaning of most words within a text is a prerequisite. It has been reported that adequate reading comprehension depends on a person already knowing 90 to 95% of the words in the text. Now I know teachers, you cannot teach 90 to 95% of the words. So what we have to make sure though, that we are teaching the ones that are text critical and language critical. And what I mean by language critical are words that we can develop that semantic lexicon around because our brain stores words in patterns. And so if I teach segregate, then now my students can access more words. They can access segregation, resegregation, anti-desegregation, desegregation, non-segregated. That's what I'm talking about, that semantic lexicon. So that word segregate is text critical, but it's also language critical because I can build their lexicon. What about language structures? Again, my pre-teaching is saying, which sentences will need explicit instruction? Are there any sentences that could cause a stumbling block for your students? Are there complex sentence, compound complex sentences, embedded phrases, words or phrase substitutions? We as educators have to predetermine those words that we are going to be, those, those phrases, those sentences that we're gonna pre-teach. What is the research? This is from Scott, 2009. If a reader cannot parse the types of complex sentences that are often encountered in academic text, no amount of strategy instruction will help. We have to make sure that we're identifying those sentences that has the complex syntax and we help them and guide them along the way. So think, verbal reasoning. What sentences need to be connected to support inferring? What figurative language needs to be explicitly taught? Kind of address that a little bit. Um, just going ahead and moving into the, what the research is saying about that, right? Um, readers use inference in combination with their knowledge of word meaning and syntax, remember I said this, and relevant background knowledge to determine the relationship. So not surprisingly, researchers determined that the ability to infer is a predictor of current and later reading comprehension. And what does it come back to? Background knowledge and vocabulary. So we have to think about what are we gonna teach before? And then I kind of address this in my planning, literary knowledge. Which graphic organizer will support the story structure and how will my students use the graphic organizer? So what the research says is, readers who are familiar with the particular structure of text have several advantages. They know what to expect, from the different parts of the text, where to search for particular types of information, and how different parts of the text are linked together. Okay? All right, I'm gonna move you back over here. So, all that is done before you start teaching. We have to think through all of that because we want kids to get to that mental model. We have to think about how all those strands of the rope. All right, so that's my pre-teaching. That's my pre-thinking. You're thinking, oh my gosh, I can't do this year after year. Remember, we have teams. And if each one of you did one text and we shared it together, you'd have your unit. And also, we all know how it goes. Like we tend to teach the same story um, over and over year to year. And so once you do it once, you just put it in your file and then you have it for the next time. So you're just building your repertoire. So day one. Now, remember, is that surface code, right? We're going to just develop an understanding of the gist of the text. The goal is that readers recognize the words in the text, activates background knowledge, makes predictions. And I actually did this with my students, okay? I did 
I spent a week on one story and at the end of the month, we did our learning target. It worked beautifully. So um, this is what I did, right? So I thought about day one, um, do my students understand the purpose of reading and the essential question? They have to know that before they read. Now, day one, um, so actually the, the, that's the pre-lesson planning was actually day zero. Like that's what I do before we read. Now we're reading. So say that I do that on a Monday. Now I'm doing this on Tuesday. So on Tuesday, um, I'm going to read the text. I'm not going to read it to them while they passively listen, which I see a lot of happen. I'm not going to popcorn read and call on children. What I'm going to do is to make sure that everybody has active participation, all kids, every minute, every time. We're going to probably do some echo reading some choral reading or some close reading, um, depending upon your, and I've worked with this with middle schoolers and they loved it. Then I wanna make sure that I think about providing oral language opportunities. I wanna make sure to increase engagement and increase conversation, because that's how we build comprehension, is I give them time to think, pair, share, turn and talk. I might have some sentence stems. Um, so what am I in my first read having them talk about? Right here, I'm having them talk about, huh, what are you thinking right now? What's happened in the story? Or what connections do you have? Um, or what are you visualizing? What are you predicting? And again, we I didn't address this, but we know good instruction follows. Um, I do, we do, you do, the gradual release of responsibility. So probably in my first read, I might be doing some modeling of my own thinking, my own connections, my own visual. And then, okay, now you think on your own and you think and pair and share. Um, vocabulary. I've already pre-taught those critical words, but now my first read, as I come up to them, I'm going to give them another hit on it because they got to see it multiple times. And I might be doing some indirect instruction of words I think they might not know and I got to clean up. Language structures. I already pre-taught a sentence that I thought was going to be troublesome, but as I'm reading, I might connect where I think I might have to connect some pronoun references. They might be, they might, I might lose them where there's a substitution they might get lost on or there's an omission. Now, verbal reasoning, I really want to hang out in those text dependent questions. When we think about that, um, I might ask who, what, did what, where, when, hi. I just want to make sure they have a general understanding of the text and the key details. At the end of my 40, 45 minutes, 50 minutes, uh, I'll review and then have a quick think, pair, share. I probably give them a sentence stem that they can talk to their neighbors. And that's kind of what my first day Tuesday would look. Wednesday, the kids come in. Same text, now we're gonna to get to that text space, develop an understanding of the connections between the text. What I want kids to be able to do is understand the literal meaning. So the planning, that text code, remember, we're watching that movie again. And um, we're gonna, we're gonna, we already kind of spent some time with the, the right there questions on day one. So now I probably am doing some think and search questions, maybe uh, author and you, but that's usually where I'm really kind of going day three is focusing on those inferential questions. So same thing, day two, how am I gonna prepare my students to understand the literal meaning of the text? You're some boxes there, you can check off what you're gonna do. How will my students read the text? I'm going to read it a second time. I've already done it one way. I'm going to be change things up, do it a different way. Verbal reasoning. Where should students make connections between paragraphs now? Right. This is now we're going to go a little bit deeper where they're noticing this is. Remember, not all kids can do this on their own. Right. This is access for all students. Um, we need to be explicit in our instruction and in our verbal reasoning and say, OK, this happened in paragraph five. This happened in paragraph eight. So what's happening and why do we know it? Right. So now it's like who or what did what was day one. Now it's like, why did they do it? And why is that important? We're collecting. So usually around day two, we're starting to collect some text evidence to go along with the answering that question at the end. Oral language, I want to provide opportunities for that. I want to make sure that I am reviewing vocabulary, um, restating the definition, providing examples, giving non-examples, and questioning. Now, again, I have text structure on here, and I did this with my own students. How can I use a graphic organizer to support understanding of the text structure? So I might have an anchor chart in front of me, and as we're going through, I might be talking through what's happening in the story, right? Because again, my 
my my summative, or I should say my learning target is writing an argument about what is the most effective, they have to have a text understanding in order to do that. So I have to walk them through this in order for them to get to that cognitive rigor of that process. So they might have an individual chart in front of them. Now, generally speaking, and you can do what you want, but you definitely want to have something at the end of day two where students show an understanding of the text base, like the gist. Um, we know the research is really clear about how critical it is for kids to be able to summarize text. And we also know how difficult it is for people to, for our kids to do that. And so it's really to work on that gist framework, who or what, did what, when, where, why, how, and so, and why does that matter? Um, oftentimes, notice I say oral summary, because we also don't understand how critical it is for kids to speak the language we want them to write. If we want them to write a summary, we have to get them to orally summarize it. And a lot of times I would have them, particularly for my kids who had working memory and cognition um, challenges, I would just do parts of it and I would phrase it and then I would have restate it. Now, the big question I get, but what about the kids who are advanced, right? And they're all in my room as an inclusive classroom. Trust me, they don't get bored by doing that. They don't get bored by having themselves just say it out loud, okay? Okay. And then I'm going to take my nose. So now, day three, same text, getting into it deeper. I want to make sure that they develop an understanding of the overarching idea of the text. And now this is where I'm having the students create that mental representation of the text based on the intertwining of the background and the meaning. And this is where we call that situational model. Lesson planning framework looks pretty similar, but now what I want to do is how do I support my students' mental representation of the text, right? What are they really going to, and it's going to go right back to what? Do the students know the learning target? Review the purpose, review the vocabulary, review the essential question. Because now what's happening is I want them to be able to kind of really hone in on what was the most effective uh, nonviolent protest technique used in this passage. Because at the end, they're going to pull it all together and write an argument across passages. So during reading, now notice this. I have echo, choral, close. But now what did I add? I added partner and independently. Remember, we talked about gradual release of responsibility. You're going to have some kids who are going to say, you know, I want to just read this on my own. And they're ready to do that. You might have some kids that's, that want to do partner reading. And so you can say, you can partner read. Kids love to partner read. Okay, I don't care what grade they're in. They love to partner read. Um, but if you have a group of kids that they're not ready for partner read, independent read, you could still choral, you could still echo it, you could still close read. But this is where that gradual release responsibility is coming into fruition. Um, you want to review focus of words. So make sure those essential, those text critical words and those linguistic critical words, you're reviewing them again, because why they're going to need those to be able to answer that significant question, that essential question at the end. Um, now here we're going a little deeper. The question I have for you is where should uh, the students draw inferences in order to answer the essential question? So, we're, this is the part where we want to make sure that they're focusing in on those parts of those passages that they really have to understand that are text critical in order to get to that essential question. And if they're partner reading, they might not be, you know, doing this so much. Um, but notice I have an opportunity. It depends on your class. Like notice I have here a Socratic seminar. Your third time through is where you could do some deeper conversations. Now, a lot of times what I would actually do is on day four. So if this is Friday, I would bring in the oral language. And on Fridays, I would do a pinwheel discussion. I would do a fishbowl discussion. I would bring in a Socratic seminar and we'd have deep oral language conversations about that text. And they didn't get tired of it because now they're answering their own questions because really they haven't had a chance to really have a deep conversation as a whole class about what's going on here. And that's why that is really, really critical that you get into your classrooms is that deep, rich 
guided conversations. And I remember, um, and hopefully some of you out there are using Socratic seminar. And I know when I used that on my last day, I had uh, my associates in my room because, you know, I had an inclusive classroom. I had kids all over the, um, all sorts of disabilities in my room and say to me, I can't believe what you got out of those kids. I've never seen them have conversations like that before. So, you know, this is where, you know, I think, you know, really I get, I get the goosebumps thinking about that and how you can bring that rich oral language conversation, those classroom conversations in. And I like to do that on Fridays. The kids love to end that week doing that and having those conversations. So I want to make sure how will my students demonstrate their mental representation of the text. I might have them do a written summary. I might have them answer an essential question. Um, but we always want to write in response to what they've read. So you could pose any kind of question, right? And what I would do, too, is give them a chance to verbalize the answer to that before they go into writing. Because writing is a complex task. And then reflection is, okay, did my students meet my learning target for the day? How do I know? How do I reteach? So um, this is a framework that I've used in my classrooms. Um, I had, like I said, um, you know, uh, an inclusive room and going through and the, explicitly teaching all those sub skills, I supported all my kids to be able to get to that learning target. So with that, I'm looking at time, we're like right on time for some Q&A. So this is that time where um, we can have some questions. I'm going to go to my next slide. And so again, um, thank you for being here today. Um, there's my phone number. You can text me and, and call me if you have any questions. I have people who do that all the time. Um, I have two email addresses. You can reach me here on my Pathways Towards Literacy, my own personal account. Um, if you have any more further questions, um, I'm grateful that you were here today. And I know I love Maya, right? right? Um, you do your best until you know better and then do better. So hopefully I got a chance for you to rethink some things on how you can up level um, your instruction in your classrooms. So thank you so much.